Taurus, now a North American car with the shape and the feel we've never seen before. Taurus, back in 1986, Ford replaced its aging LTD line with the Taurus, mid-sized four-door sedans and wagons that soon became their best-selling car, along with its near twin, the Mercury Sable. But after six generations, including that weird everything is oval model in the late 90s, the public eventually moved on, with the final model quietly discontinued as another victim of America's love of trucks and SUVs. This is the story of the Ford Taurus. This is my old car. Thanks for the many suggestions to review the Ford Taurus. I will also talk about its twin, the Mercury Sable, in this episode. If you haven't already, check out my community page to participate in polls on cars to feature in future episodes. If you were old enough to drive in the 1990s, you probably couldn't even drive a couple miles without seeing a Ford Taurus, if you weren't already driving one yourself. They were everywhere back then, thanks to it being the best-selling car in America from 1992 to 96. And they were the fifth best-selling Ford of all time, with well over 8 million sold over 34 years. But when the Taurus was first revealed in 1985 for the 1986 model year, there were a lot of skeptics, saying the look was too futuristic and would ultimately be a failure. Of course, those skeptics were typically from GM and Chrysler, who were still enjoying decent sales from the very boxy mid-sized family cars like the Chevy Celebrity and the Dodge Dynasty. But the Taurus was far from the first attempt that Ford made at moving away from the boxy styling trend that GM and Chrysler embraced. The overall shape of the first-gen Taurus wasn't too far off from one of Ford's most popular models in Europe back then, the Sierra. And in 1983, Ford introduced a radically different Thunderbird, as well as a new Tempo, both of which, like the Sierra, embraced a more aerodynamic shape. And both of those cars, along with their Mercury counterparts, the Cougar and Topaz, were decent sellers back then, proving that not everyone was a fan of boxy cars. The Taurus not only had it look similar to the European Sierra, but also to the Audi 100, better known as the 5000 in the US. So much so that some Americans back then thought Ford ripped off the Audi's design. However, the Taurus was entirely American design, unlike their other bestseller, the Ford Escort. Lots of customer surveys were done across much of the car design to help ensure that all the new advancements wouldn't turn off buyers. Something Ford learned the hard way back with the Edsel. You never saw a car like the 58 Edsel. Ford even continued production of the LTD into the 1986 model year, just in case the Taurus failed to win over buyers. But if that had happened, considering the billions spent on the Taurus development, Ford probably would have had to declare bankruptcy. Instead, the Taurus was a hit, not just with buyers, but also with the automotive press, landing in Car and Driver's Top 10 list for 1986, and it was Motor Trend's 1986 Car of the Year. Motor Trend Car of the Year. It was one of the first cars to have composite headlamps, something every car has today. But back then, Ford had to convince the NHTSA to allow the Taurus to debut without the then standard round or rectangular headlamps. The aerodynamic look continued with the flush door handles and the fully framed doors that extended into the roofline, a design that Ford had already done with success on the Thunderbird and Tempo. Like most cars back then, the Taurus had multiple trim levels, ranging from the dirt cheap L trim with a four cylinder engine, infamous gray bumpers, and only an AM radio, to the top of the line LX, with a V6 and a lot more standard features. A much more rare trim option was called the MT5, which only came with a five-speed manual transmission, hence the name, and so few were sold that it was gone two years later. Although Ford had just released their first minivan, the Aerostar, in 1986, station wagons were still a popular option back then, so the Taurus also offered a wagon. A typical day with the station wagon, except one thing's changed, the station wagon. With more cargo space than many crossovers have today, Later models would gain the option of a folding third row seat, although I can't imagine any adult wanting to sit back there. But one of the most radical design decisions, at least back then, was the front grille, or lack of it, and instead directing the air intake from under the front bumper. This, along with the composite headlamps, made the Taurus seem so futuristic that the makers of the 1987 movie Robocop used then new 1986 Tauruses for future Detroit cop cars, all painted in flat black. Your move. Creep. The same generation Taurus was used for the first Robocop sequel in 1990 Good morning. and the second sequel in 1993. And considering how bad Robocop 3 was, I wouldn't be surprised if it just used the same cars left over from the first movie. Police officer, no loitering. Of course, Mercury had their own version of the Taurus, called the Sable. Like all Mercury's back then, the Sable was marketed as the more upscale option and had its own unique front and rear end. And like other Mercury's, its own unique rear window design on the sedan, 
Although to help cut costs, the Mercury wagon we were in matched the Ford. As part of the Sable advertising campaign, Ford asked singer and actress Bette Midler to sing one of her songs for the ads, but she refused. That didn't stop Ford, as they hired a former backup singer for Midler with a very similar voice to sing it instead, without Midler's approval. Midler sued Ford in district court, but lost, so she appealed to the appellate court, which did rule in her favor. This ruling set a precedent that made all ad agencies think twice about using celebrity soundalikes in their ads. In 1989, Ford introduced a higher performance version of the Taurus, the show, which meant super high output. Its 3-liter V6 engine was originally developed by Yamaha in 1984 and was originally planned for a different car that never made it to production. But with a deal already made with Yamaha, they needed to use the engine somehow, so it eventually ended up in the Taurus. You could spot the show thanks to its fog lamps and extra side body cladding, and the show logo imprinted in the rear bumper. From the inside, you could tell it was a show with its tachometer that went up to 8,000 RPM and a manual transmission, the only transmission option for a show back then, built and designed by Mazda. By 1990, Ford also offered a plus package on the show, which you could identify thanks to the slight bulge in the hood and more blacked out trim. By the end of the first generation of the Taurus in 1991, Ford sold over 2 million of them, so the second generation beginning with the model year 1992 was more evolutionary than revolutionary, which this commercial was clearly meant to convey, as Ford didn't want to turn away the huge customer base they had earned. It was a smart move at the time, as sales increased for the 92 model, so much so that the Taurus became the best-selling car in the U.S. that year. Its all-new interior was also designed to house a passenger side airbag and was the first four-door sedan to have it standard by 1993. The second-gen Taurus was also offered with a police package with a 3.8-liter V6 and a dual exhaust, standard four-wheel disc brakes with anti-lock, and a revised grille to allow more airflow to the radiator. But the police package in the new Crown Victoria that debuted that same year was far more popular thanks to its much more durable body on frame design and rear-wheel drive so the Taurus police package didn't last beyond the second gen model. The show performance version of the Taurus also continued for the second gen, but with less aggressive styling, and by 1993, an automatic transmission became an option. In its day, this was quite a sexy car. Do you believe that? No. And the second gen Sable followed the same evolutionary changes from the first gen as the Ford did, and maintaining its wraparound rear window design. Despite a design that clearly a lot of people were happy with, Ford made the controversial decision to shake things up a bit when designing its third-gen Taurus that launched in 1995 for the 1996 model year. Automobile magazine named Taurus Design of the Year. This may have been the first car, and probably the last, to take the shape of the company logo and translate it to the entire design of the car. The headlamps and turn signals were ovals. The grille was an oval. The air intakes under the front bumper were ovals. The side windows were curved like ovals. The tail lamps were ovals. The radio pod on the dash was oval. The entire rear window was an oval. Everything was an oval. The oval look, of course, continued with the Mercury Sable. The only saving grace was that the Sable had a more conventional rectangular rear window, but not so with the wagon, on which both the Sable and the Taurus got the big oval window in the rear. The automotive press was, at least at first, generally accepting of the third gen Taurus, thanks to improved handling and an improved driving experience. But the public response was mixed at best. Truman, I think I'm gonna throw up. Whereas the first gen Taurus was sometimes criticized for what was considered a jelly bean look, the third gen swung way farther, often being called the bubble Taurus. The new Ford Taurus. When seen, it leaves an impression. Maybe Ford wanted to emulate the success Chrysler was having at that time with the more rounded shape of its LH cars like the New Yorker, but went a bit too far. Although the Taurus maintained its best selling car title for 1996, that was primarily due to 51% of the sales going to rental fleets. By 1997, the Taurus lost its best-selling car title to the Toyota Camry, a title which it has yet to relinquish. The third generation still had a show model, which was now bumped up to a V8, but the manual transmission was dropped, leaving it with the same four-speed automatic as the LX trim model. Despite the V8, and maybe thanks to the somewhat tacked-on looking rear spoiler, sales dropped significantly from the second gen, so much so that Ford opted to discontinue the show by the end of the third gen in 1999. The fourth gen Taurus, which launched in 1999 for the 2000 model year, was clearly trying to make up for the overly oval third gen. Well, they say genius is picked green, but you didn't pick it. Although there were still some oval themes, it was toned down considerably, including the dashboard no longer having the huge oval radio pod. But to save money, the rear half of the wagons maintained the same basic look as the third gen. This decision may have also been done due to declining sales of the wagon, 
thanks to the increasing public preference of minivans and SUVs. The Sable sedan maintained its own unique front and rear end, and continued a trend Mercury did with other cars shared with Ford, by eliminating the extra window behind the C-pillar. But to keep costs down, the interior was mostly shared with the Taurus. Although sales of the 4th gen had a significant bump thanks to the redesign, sales never returned to the levels they had in the 90s. Does anyone want to get out? Uh, not me. No. I'm hunky-dory. All right. I'm thinking we should look for a drive through By 2004, the wagon was gone. And by 2005, Taurus sales ranking among all cars dropped to 4th place, being beaten out by three Japanese cars, the Toyota Camry, the Honda Accord, and the Nissan Altima. This led to the Taurus reverting entirely to fleet sales in the U.S. by 2006. Not surprisingly, production ended that same year, with the final Taurus built on October 27, 2006. The last Taurus went to Samuel Truett Cathy, owner and founder of Chick-fil-A, whose first restaurant was located across from Ford's Atlanta plant, which by 2006, along with a plant in Chicago, had built more than 7.5 million Taurus models. But although Cathy assumed he was the owner of the very last Taurus, that would eventually change. It was clear to many that Ford was shifting its focus to trucks and SUVs by the 2000s. Enough so that many accused Ford of abandoning a still significant portion of the automotive market. But Ford still needed a full-size sedan to replace the aging Crown Victoria, which was soon going to move entirely to police and fleet sales. Ford tapped into resources they had with Volvo, thanks to their acquisition of Volvo back in 1999. The result was a new full-size sedan for 2004, which they named the 500, using a modified version of a platform shared with the Volvo S80. The 500, at 61 inches in height, was unusually tall for a sedan, being five inches taller than the Crown Vic. The new Ford 500, elevating the sedan. Its styling was also more typical of Volvo back then, simple and conservative, a far cry from the daring look the Taurus once had. Around the same time the 500 was launched, Ford gained a new CEO, Alan Mulally, who criticized the decision to drop the Taurus name in favor of a name as generic and uninspiring as the 500. The result was the 500 name being dropped for the 2007 model year, at least for those being sold domestically and renamed the Taurus. Other than a new front grille, it was still the Ford 500, but as a Taurus, it was now, for the first time, on an entirely new platform, and now a full-size car. Ford also decided to rename their freestyle crossover that same year to be the Taurus X, effectively taking over the role of the wagon version of the Taurus. Over at Mercury, they had also lost the Sable name when the 4th Gen Taurus was discontinued, and had their own version of the 500, called the Mercury Montego. But when the 500 got renamed to Taurus, Mercury also brought back the Sable name for their version of Ford's new full-size car, which was a bit redundant since Mercury still sold the Grand Marquis back then. Not that it mattered for long, with the Sable being dropped by 2009. You've got to put Mercury on your list. Followed by the entire Mercury line by 2010. Despite the name change, the full-size Taurus was a sales disappointment, so a sixth-generation Taurus debuted for the 2010 model year. All the oval theming was gone, replaced with a more angular shape and a high belt line that had become a more popular look for sedans in the 2010s. The same platform was also shared by the Lincoln MKS, and was the first Taurus to offer all-wheel drive. The 2010 Taurus also marked the return of the show model, its most powerful version by far, with a 3.5-liter twin-turbo V6 that made 365 horsepower. The 6th Gen also saw the return of the police package for the Taurus, which officially replaced the Crown Victoria Police Interceptor. Ford didn't even call it a Taurus, it was simply the Police Interceptor. And although it could be had with the same engine as the show, that was an option. It came standard with a lighter weight 3.7 liter aluminum block that was also in the Ford Mustang. But although the Taurus was now Ford's only full-size car, many complained that its interior space was noticeably less than the old 500. The automotive press touted its more muscular angled look, being far less dull than its predecessor, but the driving dynamics were simply not where they needed to be for a car of its size. And of course, it was a sedan, a body style that the car buying public simply wasn't buying anymore. Ford understood the sales trend and aimed for far lower sales volumes than they once had in the 90s, but also avoided sales to rental fleets to help raise the resale value. By 2016, Ford began its long-term transition away from cars and switching almost entirely to trucks and SUVs. As a result, the 6th Gen Taurus would be the last, with sales slowly dropping each year until production officially ended in March of 2019. But although Taurus' name is gone in most of the world, it still lives on in China, where it has been produced since 2015, but sharing only the name, as it is built on a stretched version of the Ford Fusion and Mondeo platform. Despite more than 8 million sold, Seeing a Taurus or Sable from the first through fourth generation is becoming increasingly rare. We're up to our eyeballs in Taurus. 
although I'm sure it still has its fans, as I expect some viewers will comment on here. It sadly has become a car that many young people today only see as a cheap used car option, and may never realize the impact that Taurus made on not just Ford, but for the entire automotive landscape for years to come. Thanks for watching. If you liked this video, click the like button and subscribe to my channel. If you once owned a car from the 80s to mid-2000s that you rarely see today and would like it featured in a future episode, leave a reply in the comments or contact me at the email shown here. See you next time.